supply chain resilience and 3D printed brain tissue have in common? This here podcast, of course. <laughs> hey there, everybody. Welcome to episode number 569 of this here electronic engineering podcast called Amelia's Weekly Fish Fry, brought to you by eejournal.com and written, produced, and hosted by yours truly, Amelia Dalton. Why, yes, we are talking about the challenges of obsolescence, how legacy equipment manufacturers can support national security and economic strength, and how the Hill Skill Will Matrix applies to OEM product discontinuation with longtime friend of the show, GDCA CEO Ethan Plotkin. Also this week, I revisit one of my favorite topics here on Fish Fry, 3D printing. Except this time, it's with brain tissue. So, first, please welcome the one and only Ethan Plotkin to Fish Fry. Hi, Ethan. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you, Amelia. Great to be here. So we're talking about how legacy equipment manufacturers can support national security, economic strength, and career satisfaction. So first, let's talk about supply chain resilience. Ethan, why is supply chain resilience so important? Well, commercial equipment supply chain disruptions have always been somewhat common, mainly related to electronics obsolescence. But it wasn't on most people's radar because it didn't really affect consumer supply chains. But then COVID happened, and the importance and fragility of supply chains really came into the public view. I remember all toilet paper shortages and PPE and even eggs at some point. So as it happens, many of the same constrained supply chain parts that affected the availability of new cars, like these parts, like semiconductors, were also used in commercial equipment that drive critical infrastructure like wind turbines. This is why supply chain resilience is so important. You never know exactly where a common point of failure will affect end users upstream, including critical applications. Sure. So what specific challenges are you seeing in this arena? <sighs> That's a good question. I think the biggest challenge is helping both industry leaders and government policymakers understand the interconnectedness and wide array of supply chain issues. I mean, when people think of supply chain disruptions, oftentimes they see it in terms of parts shortages, as we saw during the coronavirus shutdowns and those supply chain issues. But skills shortages are also a huge problem. I mean, as I mentioned in my earlier TED Talk today, indeed, the GAO, the Government Accountability Office, recently reported that each new Block 5 Virginia-class attack submarine is going to take an average of two years longer than originally planned, and that's because of workforce shortages. I think another example is, you know, most people may not be aware that neon, which is a real critical material when making semiconductors, is really very big export of Ukraine. And why is that important? Well, when the Russians invaded Ukraine, it had a chilling effect on the worldwide neon supply. It just so happens that Ukraine produces half of the neon in the world. And there are other challenges, of course. China's lock on the electric vehicle battery industry in the face of government mandates for everybody in the U.S. to really buy a zero emission vehicle, that really is causing kind of a push-pull conflict. And the list just goes on. Okay, so we should also talk about obsolescence and how it affects different aspects of the electronics industry. It affects not just military and aerospace industries, right? Absolutely right. So beyond just the common parts that go into cars and like wind turbines, there's an amazing amount of commonality of electronics parts between defense systems and other types of commercial equipment. People may be surprised to know that the same embedded computers used to control critical defense systems like Gatling guns that are defensive and protecting ships from inbound objects and projectiles also controlled rides at amusement parks rail systems, medical equipment like CAT scanners and x-ray machines. So this really reveals the unavoidable intersection between defense systems and commercial electronics. 
So earlier at the Embedded Tech Trends Conference, you mentioned a hill skill will matrix. So talk to me about this matrix and how it applies to OEM product discontinuation. Right. You know, I really like this framework because it's been very helpful in helping me coach folks to perform better. Uh, when I was a younger professional, I like to think I'm still young at heart, I had a hard time figuring out how to trust people, and which is very important when you need to delegate work, of course. So I learned about this framework as a way to verify who was trustworthy and if they were unable to complete the work precisely why they could not be trusted to do it. And in short, trust takes three critical components. So the first thing is the hill, right? Does the person understand what I need to happen? The second is the skill. Do they have the ability to achieve the outcome? And finally, the will. Do they want to do the work needed to make it all happen? So when it comes to product discontinuation, customers can use this framework to narrow down how and if an OEM can help them when they discontinue a product, right? So the first thing, the hill is easy. OEMs can absolutely understand that the customer needs the product longer than the OEM wants to provide it. So it usually comes down to either skill or will. If the OEM, for example, has trashed all the technical data, they don't have any more test gear, or it could just be as simple as the only person who really understood the product has retired, then it's absolutely a skill issue and it's easier for the customer to understand why it's difficult for the OEM to continue providing the product. Whereas if the OEM just doesn't want to help the customer with their ongoing demand, then that's a more of a political issue which involves a slightly different approach to resolving the problem than the technical issue. So, Ethan, what can we do to solve these issues? Well, I think awareness. The best thing everyone in the supply chain can do to deliver supply chain resilience is to understand the risks and issues that disrupt their specific supply chains, looking beyond their immediate customer, but all the way up to the end user at the very top of the supply chain. So whether it's a hospital or an aircraft maker or a rail operator, it's important to understand the final destination and criticality of the application in which your products are used. And from there, I think folks should just become students of all the options available to them to prevent and overcome supply chain disruptions, which means being open to innovative new solutions like the emergence of legacy equipment manufacturers, otherwise known as LEMs, LEMs versus OEMs, original equipment manufacturers. LEMs are a completely new category of companies who partner with electronics OEMs like chip makers and board manufacturers to take over responsibility for old product designs and then continue to sustain and produce those designs for as long as customers still need them. And that's a, that's a small minority of the overall original install base that the OEM originally sold the, the products to. Okay, so let's circle back to GDCA. How do you define success at GDCA? So in this light, we define success at GDCA as delivering supply chain resilience to our customers, their customers, and so on, all the way up to the end user. This is a real reason why we're in business. It's not just about delivering production orders for old embedded computer boards. Instead, it's about delivering parts for customers for as long as they need them. All right, Ethan, it is time for your off-the-cuff question. So if you could have a meal with one person today, alive or dead, who would it be? All right, I got to think about this. I think that Warren Buffett featured in my TED Talk. He is considered to be the sage of Omaha, and I really, really respected his three critical success factors to business. And the first one, and I got to say them because I, I respected it so much, I'd love to talk to him. The first one was to say no, right? Because saying yes to too many things really does distract people from the goal. And I, I respect that. I think the second thing was to really operate with integrity. You know, if you compromise your values in the face of pressure, it's really hard to always act for the good of the team. And finally, this is the piece that really, I think, resonated with me. It's to learn something new every day. And he mentioned 500 pages of reading a week. And I just want to see if he's actually reading 500 pages a week. He's probably 
knowing Warren Buffett, probably more closer to a thousand. So, but hopefully he's he's keeping it low for all the rest of us. So if you see Warren around, just please let him know that I'm buying. Oh, I will. Thank you so much for joining me, Ethan. It is always a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you, Amelia. It's been a pleasure. Did you hear that a team of researchers from the University of Wisconsin-Madison have developed the very first 3D printed brain tissue? And yes, it can grow and function just like typical brain tissue. This new development could have huge implications for neuroscience, stem cell biology, and the pathogenesis of many neurological and psychological disorders. So until now, attempts to 3D print brain tissue have had limited success. So what makes this new research coming out of UW-Madison so different? Well, a couple reasons. First, instead of using the traditional 3D printing approach where layers are stacked vertically, these researchers stacked their layers horizontally. They also used situated brain cells, neurons, grown from induced pluripotent stem cells in a softer bio-ink gel than previous research projects. Su Chun Zhang, professor of neuroscience and neurology at UW Madison's Weizmann Center, explains this important aspect of their research like this. The tissue still has enough structure to hold together, but is soft enough to allow the neurons to grow into each other and start talking to each other. Another important aspect is the thickness of the tissue. This tissue stayed relatively thin, and that made it easy for the neurons to get enough oxygen and enough nutrients from the growth media. So, the cells are laid next to each other. Think pencils laid next to each other on a table. The printed cells then reach through that medium to form connections inside each printed layer and also across layers, which forms networks that are comparable to human brains. From there, the neurons are able to communicate, send signals, interact with each other through neurotransmitters. They're also able to form proper networks with support cells that have been added to the printed tissue. So what part of the brain are we talking about? Well, more than one. Zhang explains it like this. We printed the cerebral cortex and the striatum, and what we found was quite striking. Even when we printed different cells belonging to different parts of the brain, they were still able to talk to each other in a very special and specific way. He goes on to say, Our lab is very special in that we were able to produce pretty much any type of neurons at any time. Then we can piece them together at almost any time and in whatever way we like. Because we can print the tissue by design, we can have a defined system to look at how our human brain network operates. We can look very specifically at how the nerve cells talk to each other under certain conditions because we can print exactly the way we want. So another super cool aspect of this research is that it does not require any special bioprinting equipment or culturing methods to keep the tissue healthy and can be studied in depth with microscopes, electrodes, and standard imaging techniques that are already common in the field. This team even makes it a point to call out that their printer is a benchtop commercialized one. <laughs> so, it's the flexibility of this new research that makes it so revolutionary. 
This 3D printed brain tissue could be used to do a whole lot of things like watch the brain grow, test new drug candidates, monitor the interactions between healthy tissue and tissue affected by Alzheimer's, and even study the signaling between cells in Down syndrome. Zhang explains why this research could be a game changer in the field of neuroscience. He says, in the past, we have often looked at one thing at a time, which means we often miss some critical components. Our brain operates in networks. We want to print brain tissue this way because cells do not operate by themselves. They talk to each other. This is how our brain works, and it has to be studied all together like this to truly understand it. Super cool, right? So if you want even more information about this groundbreaking 3D printed brain tissue research, or even more information about GDCA, I've included a couple links below the player on this week's fish frying page on eejournal.com and in the description for this week's YouTube episode as well. Also, make sure you subscribe to this here podcast on Spotify, Google Podcasts, Podbean, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, or just about any other podcasting platform to listen to some exciting upcoming episodes. Have you checked out EE Journal on social media yet? Well, you should. You can find us at facebook.com slash EE Journal. If you're into X, you can monitor our tweets at EE Journal TFM. And don't forget, if you'd like to follow my personal account, check out Amelia D. 1978. And hey, if LinkedIn is more your thing, I completely understand. You can follow us or me on LinkedIn as well. And we are now on Blue Sky Social and Mastodon too. And we have that YouTube channel I mentioned earlier, youtube.com slash eejournal. Folks, it is chock full of all kinds of techie videos, including our very popular Chalk Talk webcast series, hosted by me. That's right. <laughs> and of course, you can subscribe to our EE Journal YouTube channel as well. Thank you everyone for tuning in. If you know of any cool new technology or heck you just want to chat, shoot me a line at Amelia, that's A-M-E-L-I-A, at eejournal.com or post a comment on our forums on EE Journal. For the week of February 16th, 2024. I'm Amelia Dalton, and you've been fried.